punch something. Um, but this poem is titled, The Weather Man Gets the Curse in Chicago. Accounting for your particular red pixel pinned on the zoomable map, your precise crucifix of latitude, longitude. Profanity may be the most incisive means of discussing today's clouds and what wet remittance they have hauled upon your head. Every footprint is an exit on the ever blazing jet streams. Any footprint is now a potential fuck when freights of drought or heat voided air sail into our weather systems ports. Aren't you tired of hearing about Chicago and its taloned wind, its L rail set aflame to stem frostbite in the tracks, switches, toes, wings, and noses? Let's take a poll. Raise your middle finger if lately you too have lifted an expletive to the sky, a kite curse to glide its way around the globe and back to the peoples whose industries fabricated the blizzard you must dig free from or the flooding from which you will not, or the calor which smiles as it strangles you. The globe is gifting us all an opportunity to become climate masochists, to smugly shit and goddamn our way towards feeling superior in our intemperate suffering. If, in the end, our one hand cannot halt our other hand, as it extends its thumb, hitching us toward terrestrial dismissal, then at the least, we sh all should enjoy the privilege of calling the wind everything but a child of God, of smirking while we scoff at the idea that the weather could possibly hate someone somewhere more than its gyre to seethe for you or you. Um, so this next poem is a, a sort of sonnet I'm, I'm still working on it, it's not, it's not quite there yet, but I've uh, been encountering the phrase a lot uh, recently, or, you know, people just wanna burn everything down, you wanna burn everything down, uh, most recently in reference to the uh, Barrett confirmation hearing. So I just wanted to write a, a sonnet about that idea of people wanting to burn everything down. Uh, so this is poem and praise of burning everything down. In this darkness even, I do not dream of pyres. That is you, your mouth full of immolation, its altars. Please chew, please swallow. Chomping static does not allow us to hear clearly what you are failing to say about what you fear I want for your nation. Yes, a nation is a fire hazard a bundle of pages that pronounce you are free or not. I dream I too would love the well-inked page whose fibers had always housed the whole of my being human. What then to me is this American paper castle whose crest can only speak half my name, if that, if that. If the match is already in my hand, you are beyond the use of worry. To save your spit for the burning kiss. And this last poem is from uh, issue 26. It's uh, a study in aging. And uh, again, it was a pleasure reading with you all tonight. I'm happy to be here and I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the, the poems. A studying aging. In your right hand, a neat glass of maker's mark sipped just enough to risk the sloshing. Your left hand grips the headboard, your feeling face, eyes closed. You navigate me with your hips, a sight so beautiful I have to laugh. Now that's some black shit. And we are old enough to know how true that is, to savor the elegant fuck it all that somehow carried our mothers and fathers, mothers and fathers forward in this country that tries so hard to make us unseen. James Baldwin said, they may not know what we want, 
but they know they wouldn't want to be black in this country. That that was all they needed to understand. But wouldn't they want to be us in this moment? Two bodies as pleasures, pure insistence, escaping in ways our mothers and fathers might think us too old for. In a short spell before we rouse at 3 a.m. to again rattle each other, we'll call the concierge twice to report the boisterous high schoolers flanking our hotel room as if we weren't just ruckus ourselves. When security arrives to rap on their door, there's the satisfaction of teaching those kids a lesson. Also the worry of wondering what the guard will see, what the, sorry, what the guard will see when he sees their skin. But the kids aren't brown. We can tell by the casual and wholly appropriate tone the officer takes with them. They are just children, as we maybe once were. And they aren't making the same noise we are. The well-earned and lusty disturbance that is creation, a history you don't dare interrupt with a knock. Wow, I get to clap. Thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, very important work at this moment. I'd like to introduce next El Nash. El Nash is the author of the novel, Animals Eat Each Other, and the forthcoming collection of stories, nudes. Her work appears in Bomb, Guernica, The Nervous Breakdown, Literary Hub, the fanzine, the creative independent, New York tyrant and elsewhere. She's the founding editor of Witchcraft Magazine and a fiction editor at Hobart Pulp. Welcome, Elle. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me um, and including my work in this issue. It feels really special. Um, tonight, I'm actually going to read something different though that was a New York tyrant called Room Service. Um, this was published about two years ago. Um, and it's shorter, so it seems more adept for a reading. Okay. On our wedding night, David shows me what it takes to kill a man. In the hotel room, we lay on the unmade California King, my stocking slick against the stainless white sheets. David opens his laptop and navigates to a website full of recordings like this a video of a man being burnt alive in a cage, his body going taut and black, a video of a man getting shot in the head, a cavity the size of a fist blowing out the back of his skull. There are a lot of things I don't know about my new husband. He looks at me when he pulls up the video. His eyes are slightly sallow and set back like a farm animal, expressive and docile. I pretend to watch, but I focus my eyes on the intricate beating of my wedding dress draped over a chair in the corner. My breasts ache. The man on the screen shrieks and a sheet of goosebumps appears on my skin. I am filled with something soft and new and want to cry, but nothing comes. It is not ready. I imagine the funeral, open casket, the man's head sewed shut where the bullet left, sunken in like a newborn fontanelle. Once, my sister asked me to watch her baby. I'd never been around babies before. I put the baby on the bed to change its diaper and turned around for just a second. The cold thud of its body against the hardwood paralyzed me as I waited for it to scream or cry. Before I turned around in that split second of silence, I imagined the baby was dead, how my sister would never forgive me and forever be marred by its absence. But the baby wasn't dead. The baby just sat there and didn't do anything. I looked at the baby and the baby looked at me. First, the baby said, ma, 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 ma. Then the baby said, da, 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 da. Then the baby said, a, da, a, da, a, da, ugh, sis, 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 sis. I stood there watching language form in the mouth of the baby how a syllable was connected to each emotion, the da connected to the loud emotions, and the ma connected to the quiet emotions. When the baby tried to move its lumpy body, it kicked its legs hard in the air and the baby banged its head and nothing happened. In our hotel room, David takes off his black trousers and his shiny new shoes and puts them directly on top of my dress. 
I don't say anything about the shoes on the dress because I bought it from a Salvation Army for less than $20 and there were already yellow armpit stains in the lace and brown spots on the train. He gets into bed with me and puts his hand into a bag of potato chips. He eats the chips one by one, wiping crumbs onto the comforter before navigating to another video on his laptop. Movies make death sterile, he says. There is a lot more blood and violence than you think. I sip champagne from a plastic flute while the video plays. It's from a series called Cops versus the Public. Sometimes the public wins, but mostly the cops do. In one, a man in Los Angeles is being commanded to release his gun as he stands on his doorstep. Four flashlights pointed at him, four cops behind the camera. The man hesitates, then throws the weapon underhanded to the ground. Someone releases a K-9 unit. As the German shepherd rushes towards the man, one cop fires and then everyone fires. The cops empty their clips into the man and the dog. David turns to me and says, fuck LA. Why, I ask. I ask my new husband a lot of questions. David says the cops in LA are always ready to fire. That he once had a gun pulled on him for a routine traffic stop. What were you doing in LA, I ask. The receding edges of his mouth tremble. Nothing, he says. I was traveling out there to buy a car. He unbuttons his shirt and removes it, and I rub my hands across his back, feeling the raised scars of the black and white chain link fence tattooed across his shoulder blades. There are three letters in the tattoo, abbreviations or initials. He won't tell me what it means. Three weeks ago, I offered him a place to stay when we met in line at CVS. I was filling a prescription for Ativan and he was buying Bronchade and caffeine tablets. Something about the shape of his body told me he'd done terrible things. I had always wanted to date a man I thought might murder me. The hotel is the nicest place I've ever slept. And as I move my legs across the sheets, I know I am not good enough for them. I don't ask David how much the room cost or how he paid for it. He lights a cigarette and I take another sip of champagne and ask him for a cigarette. He hands me the one he just started, flipping it around the way you hand someone a sharp knife, butt end first. I take the cigarette and then he lights his own. I watch him wipe potato grease off his fingers onto the perfect white sheets before touching the keys on his laptop. The champagne bottle is almost empty. I ask my husband if it's okay to call room service for another and he says, yes, baby, but we have to put the cigarettes out first. I grab a pillow from the bed and hold it across my breast. Why do they empty the entire clip, I ask. My husband says something about nine millimeter bullets and how they are useless. He puts a large hand on my stomach and rewinds the video of the man in LA. He plays it again, frame by frame. Here is where the man releases the gun. Here is when the gun is five inches away from his hand, when a cop releases the German shepherd, when a cop shoots first. Here is where everyone else fires. And then the man goes down and kicks his legs into the air. And here it's too dark to see what the dog is doing, but we know the dog is dead. David says, do you see why it takes a firing squad? It lets everyone feel like they've killed while also absolving them of knowing who did it, who had the confirmed kill. When I take too many pills, a sinking feeling envelopes me. When I lay down, I go deeper than my bed. I lay into the floor, beneath the floor and feel smothered, but the smothering isn't claustrophobic. It feels comforting, like a womb. Do you think they can feel their life leaving, I ask? He moves his hand to my chest and grabs my tit, swollen like a nectarine. The brain goes on repeat, he says. Shock pushes the body to move, so even while it's dying, it doesn't know it's dying. He massages his thumb in circles, and though it kind of hurts, I don't say anything. Room service knocks, and I jolt from the noise. We put our cigarettes out and David unlatches and answers the door in the nude. He comes back with the bottle and we pop it open, taking turns holding it by the neck while we drink. He brings me an out of van from my purse, taking one for himself. I grab the room service menu and crush the tablet as we watch the video again. I think of my sister's baby and how once a life is gone, it's gone. How we take risks without realizing they are risks exactly. How death can come for us at any moment. The pain in my tit lingers and I think of the baby I know is already in me. I touch my stomach when I watch the man on the screen die. And the man on the screen says, mom, 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 mom. 
and the man on the screen says, oh God, oh God, oh God, ugh. And the man on the screen kicks and kicks his legs. And then he kicks his legs one final time. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was amazing. Wow. All right. Randall Mann is the author of four poetry collections, including Proprietary, which was the finalist for the Northern California Book Award and the Lambda Literary Award. He is also the author of a book of criticism, The Illusion of Intimacy on Poetry, and co-author of the textbook Writing Poems. He received the 2013 J. Howard and Barbara M. J. Wood Prize from Poetry. Thank you, Randall, for reading tonight. Thanks very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so it's, uh, it's an honor to be here with you folks and uh, thank you Heidi and Peter and Kate and everyone at Detroit. Um, it's, uh, it's such a great magazine. It's a really fantastic issue uh, and it's exciting to be back in your pages. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm just gonna read three poems uh, today and, uh, and I'll end with the, the poem that's, that's in the current issue. Um, so I have, a, I have a book coming out next year um, and this is, the, uh, this is the title poem. This poem is after Julio Cortazar, A Better Life. It's silly to think 14 years ago, I turned 30. How I made it that far, I'll never know. In this city of hills, if there was a hill, I was over it. Then in queer years, years are more than. Soon it will be 15, since the day I turned 30. It's so remote. I didn't think I'd make it to 14 years ago. Fear lives in the chest like results. You say my gray, it makes me look extinguished. You make me cringe. I haven't cracked the spines of certain paperbacks or learned a sense of direction, even with a slick device. But the spleen doesn't ask twice, and soon it will be 15 years since I turned 30, which may not sound like a lot which sounds like the hinge of a better life. It is, and it is not. <clears throat> so this second poem is a new poem. Um, and it, it's dedicated to my friend, Doug Powell. September. The birds are relentless. Oh, well, the unseen, maybe they've always been this loud. Yes and no, like always, beyond words. Here's one, death, a classic, death, is all the little hints, a blown porch light, screeches and raccoon prints on the back steps, then nothing in the morning, that after party, when it's all right. I've seen a lot of free porn and speeches, but California is on fire, so let me shut the actual door. 
At least my recent trip to the clinic was uneventful. Thanks, pandemic. Not like in April when I peed in a cup, etc., and told I was stuck with four STDs. Four. Not exactly a shock. I worry about my small bladder. I tell myself it's always been like this. It has, but I guess it's getting worse. I never sleep through the night and my nightmare is not getting assigned the aisle on a flight. Oh, to travel again. Cars still are barreling over the top of Castro. Someone's going somewhere. On a day, the weather index is green. Doug and I meet in the park. He hands me tomatoes in a coal hardware bag and unwraps his newest penis painting. Such care with the pubic hair. And we read aloud new poems at the music concourse, then order dipped soft serve at the twirl and dip behind the music. Of course, there is no music anymore. We simply devour what is ours. <clears throat> and finally, uh, this is the poem that appears in the current issue. Thank you again so much. <clears throat> this is about a different park in San Francisco. A walk in the park. The palms along Dolores Street do not belong. The past looms like chat rooms. At the top of the park, a fellow suns himself. They call the hill the fruit shelf. The view from here, ruthless, more or less. We play a game of name, the building that was raised. Ding, ding. Downtown, off limits as a wish or noun. The weeds, like all the right wrong words or none. Swish, swish. I'd trade interest rate and day trade for clean your house in the nude days and date the broke actor days. Urinal talk. This is as close as we can get. Show, don't show, and yet, and yet. The city, part sunny aggression, part accent piece. Rush, rush. The smoke, the dirt, the sky. I spy the gospel in the park. Septic, lush as real money. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randall. That was fantastic. Um, I want to introduce Allison Rollins and I'm going to give her an introduction and we're going to do something a little different here because she's got some visual poems to share with us, as you may have seen from the issue. Allison Rollins debut poetry collection Library of Small Catastrophes was recently published by Copper Canyon Press. Her poems have appeared in American Poetry Review, New England Review, The New York Times Magazine, The Poetry Review and elsewhere. She's received numerous fellowships from Kaveh Kahnem, Kalalu, and NEA, as well as the Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship. Allison's been honored with the Pushcart Prize and the Rona Jaffe Writers Award. She serves on the faculty for the Pacific Northwest College of Arts Low Residency MFA. All right, welcome, Allison. 
Thank you so much. Hi, y'all in the Zoom realm. Um, it's wonderful to be sharing space with you all. I'm super, super geeked as a fangirl of Tracy, particularly <laughs> to hand the baton off to her to read next. But um, it's wonderful to be on the virtual pages of an absolutely, honestly, phenomenal issue. I'm going to share my screen for all of my poems so that all of those um, persons or folks online can follow along as I read. Um, and this issue is a uh, one of my newest visual poems called A Song by Any Other Name. Songbirds, singing birds, songsters, listen, you hate to see it. Crows, let me rope you in. Amongst the two blacks is misery enough, God knows, but no poetry. The starling, pastor, shepherd bird, no 14 nestled in a nest of sonnets. In the sticks, the crown lost its head. In a cloud of sweet rain was a lyric tuned into the keyhole stars. I've yet to speak of voice as instrument. To do so, I would have to sound off. Unladylike on account of my seedy character, the early five gets the worm. About 50 11 times I have been dragged. The blackbird tip trills. The nightingale poet is epic in scope. God said three is what I'm afraid of. The song thrush poet set free in verse. Lily white, the mountain and the skylark are at one another's throats. Beyond what I can imagine, night is backwash, a swallow. And the next two poems I'll read, shout out also to editorial staffs all across the globe. Y'all do amazing, amazing work. Um, with uh, just, it's, I'm always in awe. So uh, shout out again to Droid and also to Rumpus staff. These two poems appeared, um, I guess this spring. But for the love of God, I am a woman. Undone, a woman is a man. I am a woman who gave birth to the idea of a man who could outdo himself only if he tried. To make love to my namesake, I take up my strap-like arms, for in fact, she wants no part of any man. To piggyback on the mention of her pink, I'm feeling myself, I'm feeling myself. There are women who have cut off whole parts of themselves and done it in the name of love. When I straddle a man, I too can get carried away. In the holy book to come, I have a cow as a horse. You will die from laughter at the sight. I have beat a thing to death and called it horseplay. As good as dead, I'm not of this world, but in it. I began in no man's land, a nobody. I waited for God to count me in, to send me to a city made of stone. Look back at it. A man of letters eyes me from across the way. He, homo erectus, sings darkness back from the hills of my unholy posterior. The intoxicating clap of twofold things, hands, cheeks, lips clasped together. Want takes hold of all creatures, big and small, top, to bottom, I trace his pointed supplications with what God has entrusted to me alone, a mouth that sways and drags, rested forth by the same song of longing. I beg to be free, laden with a memory of horses, and I, already half dead, take this man beside himself with anguish, a trembling housed in his single-minded fingers. He dares me to beg for mercy until pain turns into pleasure 
as if something can be loved beyond the certainty of change. It is true. He loves me in every way possible, my labyrinth of unending mirrors, my singular unfolding of his hunger. The waiting on him is hard. It wears on me like a harness. Even the night must put in work. Need and desire partition the day as I suck sugar from a wishbone's head. I mount and ride him into a horse. No man can serve two masters. I'll read two more, both appeared um, in Poetry Magazine, I guess, February of this year. This one, um, I have fond memories of riding the Jeffrey Jump bus in Chicago, reading Maggie Nelson's Argonauts in the morning. So this is with a nod to her parable of the goldfinch. I think you overestimate the maturity of adults. If a man who thinks he is a king is mad, a king who thinks he is a king is no less so. Heavy is the light head that crowns before the leaves loosen. Beneath the mask of a father is a grapefruit, a boy in fear of his own fingers. From fear's fetus comes the notion of gratitude. We are indebted even before we are born. My occasional chin hairs are masculine, plural, because our tongues are violent pink and I cannot speak of blood without teeth because I never learned how to whistle and I can't seem to kick this body. I have adopted this brittle lake of truth. On one hand sits a song, on the other, my father eats a bird. And lastly, at least a dozen bluettes. I, the telltale animal, rest my throat against the snare of you, offer my howl to the black-eyed Susan in free will, one fistful of yellow stubbing the chin of Never Neverland. We try our best to out the devil, to trace his foul mouth lips that outline why we desire what we loathe. It was your personhood that made me lose hope, that prison system of a language. I keep a payphone in my living room for you. It rings when I touch myself, the nostalgic purpose of ill will. I am a marked woman now, nape backlit with you in shades of blue, suffering the robe pity slips off at dusk. I will always give you credit for such undressing. No, a form of never, clings like stringy meat to peach pit. I have yet to love a man who has not strangled me to death, has not tried to muzzle want upon waking. If startled, I shout out the names of gods or unborn babes a once upon a time of denials. I count black sheep and wait for the sound of your touch. These numbers are a nervous system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, wow. Okay, how's everyone doing? I'd like to welcome up Tracy Brimhall, the author of three poetry collections, Sodade from Copper Canyon, Our Lady of the Ruins, and Rookery. Tracy's poems have recently appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry, The Nation, The Believer, The Adroit Journal, and elsewhere. She's currently an associate professor of creative writing at Kansas State University. Tracy, take it away. Thank you. I'm so excited to get to read after Allison too. I know you all just made the order at random, but it was a few years ago. I was feeling really disheartened about poetry and my love had sort of like 
I don't, I mean, all love gets a little boring at some point. It's just fights about laundry and taxes. Um, but hearing Allison read that night in St. Louis, it's just like, yes, yes, let's rekindle this flame. Let's do this. And she just got me so fired up about poems and what they can do. Um, and one of the things I've been doing off and on since is writing back to um, the very first poems I wrote in grad school. So I, I'm like writing call and response poems back to, because that's what you know, a marriage counselor would probably tell me to do um, with a lifelong love is when you fall out of love, do the things that helped you know, spark that to begin with. Um, so when uh, COVID sent me home, I brought home all of the books. I made this list of like the books I loved in grad school. And I've been writing these response poems to my, to my early poems to try and like sort of recapture some of that feeling. So the poem um, in Adroit called Co Cold, Crazy, Broken um, was sort of a, a pseudo sonnet, um, to use uh, Kyle's term, back to a set of dueling sonnets that I had in my first book. Um, so I've been trying to write dueling sonnets and I've never quite gotten it in a title, but um, that was one of the ideas is to go back to heartbreak and see what I had to say to it. So this, um, this one appeared in the new issue of Adroit, Cold, crazy, broken. At the end of it all, he accused, you always had good self-preservation instincts. Oh, my selfish survival. I don't regret it, though I'm not sorry I held his breath between my horns until he explained me to myself, said cold, said crazy, said broken, like an owl donating a mouse's bones to the barn floor, an archeology span of gray. The end was a table set for 12, a daisy sharpening each glass of milk. Before the end, it was like the story of a woman who woke to her pet constrictor stretched out against her in bed, tail hooked to toe, split tongue tasting the salt of her dream, each vein hot with her sleep, and her veterinarian warned the beloved serpent was measuring to see if she'd fit. I've woken like that, needed a doctor to say, let go, you did everything you could. At the end, he looked at me, eyes brown and delicate as a fossil in limestone and said, my love was too weak to keep him alive. God, I am tired of fetishizing resilience. I am ready for a breviary breviary of arrows knocked and aimed at the blood dam between rib and rib, tongue lapping at the garden's gold riot, the sorority of cone flowers posing for finches suspicious of a synonym that close to God's heart. I'm ready for a love with hope in it, plausible, living, holy in its listening, like my pothos perking when I sing to its vines, or the raven I brush the wrong way to reveal behind the dark of its feathers, the deeper dark of its hearing. Listen, I become the story of me, cold as mint, crazy as holding my shadow's hand, broken as the night, when the new moon rises through it. Um, those of us who were here a little early ended up talking about AWP. Um, and um, I'm gonna read my AWP poem next, um, which uh, includes, uh, this was um, back when we were um, on the West Coast, I know, when we were in Portland, um, some of the conversations I ended up having there. Um, and part of it was just, I wanted to write a poem for friends. Um, and so one of the J's, uh, so that it's for A and G and B and J and J and J. And one of the J's is here, it's Jenny Mulberg, uh, who's the person in the poem that I accidentally sexted. <laughs> and I think is the only person in the audience I've accidentally sexted. So, <laughs> um, uh, because my, my partner's name begins with a J too. So she got, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad, it was fine. Um, but I just wanted to write a poem about friends and in honor of friends and quoting friends. Um, and for me, AWP is, is that time that I know lots of people rag on it pretty hard, but I'm an intimacy slut. And like, that is just like the best, uh, like emotionally sluttiest time of my whole year. And I love it. Um, the poem's title is Matrophobia, um, which isn't a fear of mattresses. It's a fear of becoming one's mother. Matrophobia. My friend says, if I'm afraid of becoming my mother, I should work on my relationships. We've confessed the darkness of our parents' minds has startled out of, the darkness our parents' minds has startled out of hiding. A fire eel insinuating the black ribbon of its body against the tank's green murk. 
In the dim bar, in a wet city, we whisper and sip sparkling rosé, spooning lamb soup from floral teacups. Strong connections safeguard mental health, she says. So I tell that to a new friend under fake ivy vines laced with Christmas lights as we eat chocolate sheet cake, amputated congratulations piped bright on the frosting. He and I have only met twice, but we joke we're lifelong friends, so I can say I am not my mother. I give him my number, I want more friends, to protect me from the ghosts in my genes. And he texts me, every connection is a prayer against loneliness, because he'd said it in person, voice soft as ink, and I didn't want to forget. My love texts, the blackness of space glows in the microwave. Desire leafs in me like burnt paper, warm stain on my fingertips. I write back that I'm coming home and what I want to do to him when I get there and send it to a friend on accident. She says she's flattered, but knows the message isn't for her. I feel closer to her because she lets me make mistakes. The bar walls absorb night like a pupil, and my best friend says I shouldn't deny people the dignity of their consequences. But my mother taught me love has a sufferer and a witness. Another friend says her body is rejecting the cadaver bone in her finger. I take the hand that's not holding the cabernet, my thumb on her thumb, a fierce gentleness. I feel the inherited dark, retreating but alert, the black gasping against the love like the inside of a child's mouth after the mother delivers it. And the last one I'll read um, is, is related, it's, and it's the other piece that came out in a droid, and it's called Prayer Against Diagnosis. Um, I've been writing much more narratively and stuff lately, but um, that, of course, the, the diagnosis is the fear of becoming my mother and um, what I watched her life become um, and what became of her at the end of her life and my fear that that, that could be me too. So it was so great to get to read here with uh, friends old and new and for my inner intimacy slut to have this really great connection time with a bunch of other writers. And thank you again, Adroit, for publishing these poems. Um, I've never been in Adroit, um, other than like all of the other support that Adroit has shown me with, with reviews and all this other love, and I'm so excited to see my poems in there too. Prayer Against Diagnosis. Lord, loosen your belt of light. Hold your fists as open as an unread psalm, extinct as kings. I gave myself naked to your swans, crowned and bloodied, and sank like belief. Darling mountain fire, swear my mother and I are different enough. Her heart, a babble of magpies. My heart, hived to the white funeral of ours. I grieve quietly, like a parent, after crafting a knife of snow. Oh, now voices, the voices. My fantasies of faith are not like hers. Dead rabbits don't cry when vultures discover them. They're dahlias. Sorry, that was fantastic. And I feel like like this community of friends, um, we won't all sext each other, but I feel like this is a large community of friends um, that you have now created. All right. Jenny Sang, Jenny Sang's flash fiction connect collection, The Passion of Wu and Isol was a Firecracker Award finalist and winner of the Eric Hoffer Book Award. And her novel, Mayumi and the Sea of Happiness was shortlisted for the Penn American Center's Robert W. Bingham Prize for debut fiction and the New England Book Award. Essays from her manuscript, Mixed Feelings about growing up and multiracial in America have recently appeared in the Paris Review Daily, Catapult Magazine, Poetry Magazine, and Echo Tune. Welcome, Jenny. Jenny here. Whoops. Is Jenny here? Okay. Well, I'm going to move on then. Um, Darius, are you ready to step in and 
We'll come back to Jenny, hopefully. Maybe Jenny got lost. Okay. I'd like to welcome Darius Simpson up next. Darius is a writer and educator and skilled living room dancer from Akron, Ohio. He's a two-time finalist at the College Union's Poetry Slam Invitational, and Darius is a candidate for an MFA in creative writing and poetry from Mills College. He currently works as an educator with You Speaks and the San Francisco Jazz in schools all over the Bay Area. Thank you, Darius, for your work and for being here tonight. Can you unmute? Yeah. Can you hear me? Hey, yes. I, I lied. I was ready and then my fan was still on. Um, hey, y'all. What's up? Um, oh, the ways. Yeah, really excited to be a part of um, this issue to be here tonight to read poems. I'm gonna read and get out the way because I'm in a listening mode and I've been like comfortably sitting back. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some poems and then get back to listening. Um, yeah, the, I'm gonna read the first, the first one I'm gonna read is from the issue. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about how to swing back at the state or swing back at state violence in particular through poems. And so the first two are responses to that. Um, Etymology of fuck 12. Bang is a troublesome way to introduce yourself. One of us is indeed a squadron of riots unfolding. The other of us is a cityscape choking on tear gas. Rebellion is the most natural form of self-defense. Slave catching dressed in uniform is still a first punch. Fred Hampton's door said, you dropped something. Angela Davis Afro said, y'all tried it. Asada said, nothing much. Once I tried talking to a killer. I have the handcuff scars to prove it. In a matter of seconds, I've seen improbable cause devour innocence. Your prejudicial bloodlust is off its leash, chewing on my sister again. Your great great granddaddy was a double barrel shotgun. You sound just like him. Um, it's always, always, always weird being in the virtual space, crickets after a poem. Um, so if, I, if we were in person, uh, and I was doing like, first of all, I don't think I would do poems straight out the dock like this. So this is like, uh, you know, um, but I would be like, new shit. And then I would ask God, he'd be like, straight out the dock, son. So I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna do that for myself because we still call and response, amen. Um, <laughs> this poem is, yeah, I'm just gonna do the poem now. Uh, 1033 outside your local precinct. The state got a single action trigger for a tongue or the military got an armory sense of humor or White House neckties casually point to brown land on desktop globes and say dance, say decompose or else or occupation is a sad song if the troops march to a ceaseless tempo or if you say solidarity three times in a dark bathroom, you wake up with a face full of closed casket. Or in a white mouth, the wrong word is gunpowder. Or on the right side of state violence, gun on the brain makes you target practice. Gun in the heart makes you headline worthy. Gun in hand makes you old news. Or my parents were God-fearing gamblers, which makes me too shake short of good citizenship. So don't ask me if I voted before you ask about this knife between my shoulder blades or the puppet string on the mayor's cufflinks or the curly pink tail on the sheriff or bad jokes end in flat lines. And if you listen to the way tear gas hisses, you'll hear pigs laughing. Uh, this last one, I like I'm just, going straight through them. We here, we here now. Uh, last one is called, If I'm Caught Between a Badge and a Heart. I'm gonna say something about the poem, you know, I'm decided halfway through the title. Uh, so thinking about how, uh, like, 
on social media, there was this call for like, if, if, if I'm killed by the police, do this, do that. Um, also around Sandra Bland, there was a call, I don't know if y'all remember, um, saying like, you know, if I'm, if I'm taken by police, I did not kill myself and things like that. And so I was thinking about what it, what it's like to like, to make commands of the folks that will be, that, that survive us. And so I, I, I thought about what it would be to ask a question of, of my peoples and the peoples that are around my peoples after I'm gone. Um, and so if I'm caught between a badge and a hard place, three hours after the street lights turn on, will you church it? Will you pass it along pews of almost saints until it reaches the whole congregation? Will you tithe it? Will you stretch it thin like goat skin over the shell of a djembe drum? Will you slap it? Will you let the echo dance naked in the wet cave of your throat? Will you bark it? Will you sing it like my mother is listening? Will you inhale until your lungs nearly burst, then inhale some more, then and only then will you say my name? Will you put some stank on it? Will you juke joint James Brown it? Will you Jerry Curl spray it? How can I rest in peace or power if you get all lazy lipped when you talking about me? Will you scoop it thick? Will you stir it slow? Will you mac and cheese it? Will you mm, 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 to spread the savory over your tongue? Will you let it marinate? Will you serve it with Sunday dinner? Now, if you say my name, and cast iron skillets don't start to rattling. That means you ain't say it loud enough. Will you say it again? If a redwood don't split open from the trunk, that means you ain't pronounce it right. Will you say it again? Will you redecorate a city in streams of fire after me? Will you paint downtown a scorching hue? Will you stain the sky in black smoke? Will you tell ghost stories over the ashes of this empire? Will you scream it? Will you stand in a clutter? of rush hour traffic to let them know what kind of boots I wore. Will you stomp it into the soil of the last place I laughed with my whole body? Will you dance it? Will you Saturday night praise it? Will you tambourine it? Will you drunken favorite song shout it? Will you full moon howl? Will you shriek? Will you chant? Will you live? Will you cry? Will you cry for me? Will you? Woo! Thank you. Okay. Wow. Jenny Mulberg is the author of Marvels of the Invisible, which won the Tupelo Press Berkshire Prize and Refusal. She is the recipient of the NEA Creative Writing Fellowship, as well as numerous scholarships and fellowships. Her work has recently appeared or is forthcoming in Plowshares, Gulf Coast, Tupelo Quarterly, Indiana Review, the Missouri Review, and other publications. Thank you, Jenny, for joining us. Thank you, Heidi. And um, since I'm unmuted, I'm going to give all of the readers like a big audible round of applause. Um, I'm so glad to be with you all here tonight and not watching the debate. Um, and I just want to thank Peter and Heidi and Kate um, and, and the wonderful staff at Adroit. Um, I love you guys. You do such amazing work. I'm so grateful to you. Um, and it's such an honor to read alongside um, uh, writers and poets who I so admire. So thank you all for your words. Um, I'm fortunate to have four poems in the new issue of Adroit. And so I'm going to read all of them. Um, and I just want to give you a quick content warning. There are some images of domestic violence in these poems. I'm going to read them in order too, if you'd like to follow along with the issue. Occam's Razor. My friend and I are trauma bonded. When our abuser's wife lies, our Pegasus brains blink on in the night, beaconing the imaginary. If you hear hooves, remember, there are no unicorns, only the meat packing plant. The train you hear is no tornado. Not northern lights, but the sky's explainable chemistry. Wittgenstein says, if a sign is not necessary, then it is meaningless. 
The abominable snowman shoves one giant fur toe beyond the tree line, testing our boundaries. Swinburne says, either, either science is irrational or the principle of simplicity is a fundamental, synthetic, a priori truth. A woman's cop husband shot her twice in the head, placed his service gun beneath her pajama chest. Her fuzzy pink slippers peeked from the closet. The dog's leash, a golden lasso on the floor. A plurality can't be posited without meaning. The cop husband invented his wife's suicide note, thinking her dead. If you can sail around the world, then it is not flat. Our abuser's wife feeds the cat makes some calls, bandages her hand. He says to her, don't push it. We know why she lies. We lied for him too. Um, so it seems appropriate that we just passed the uh, 15th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Um, and so this next poem is um, sort of my humble, humble offering of my perspective of the storm. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I was living in South Louisiana during Hurricane Katrina and I just lost my beloved 15 year old dog who was lost during the storm and who I rescued after that. Um, I'm also teaching Patricia Smith's wonderful Blood Dazzler. Um, so it's, it's really on my mind. So this is Baton Rouge Harvest Moon puts me in mind of sea, whiskey on the pickup bed, 5 a.m., sky and oil spill. After the storm, we never went to bed. Our street, blown out billboards, emergency highway. I went to meet the truck of animals to try to help in some way. But when the truck arrived, all the animals were dead, pulled from the mud for nothing. I have never talked about the stain on the street. I drove past every day where a car hit my friend. Two green mallards fanned their wings across C's back, one for each of his brothers. The first was an accident, the second grief. I loved him in my dumb way. When he passed out in the neighbor's trash, I lifted him, his black curls against my neck. We had coffee, but there was still whiskey in it. His parents lived in the FEMA trailer parked at the horse farm. They'd lost their hardware store in Homa, the coast's eye. Grief came up out of the earth. There were many false saviors with boats full of dogs. Don't they know you can't build a grave in the swamp? C was the last brother. In the storm, the other two rose out of the earth. He never talked to anyone. I know nothing about loss. The prism of his face at 5 a.m. was a question. What was left of the family stood on the coast as the boats resurfaced. Um, this next poem is based on my experience from the past year. Uh, thanks, 2020. <laughs> um, so I talk about this more at length in my conversation with Heidi in the issue. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about the broken systems of justice in this country. Um, and this poem arose from my experience of the system's failures to protect victims of abuse. Proceedings. The honorable answer offers me the option to reset my court date due to his personal relationship with my abuser's mother. I have driven halfway across middle America through rhinestone studded stampedes in the great dripping caves of the Bible Belt to Broken Mirror County. Broken Mirror, where I was once thrown in a room with a pit bull. The dog slept with his sweet paw around me and breathed his panicky breath into my neck. To say me is a stretch. The self was a rock blown into many rocks, sparkling and hot. The alpha made of me a souvenir. 
He put me in a box he occasionally opened, then vanished me in the palm of his hand. Whereupon the following proceedings were heard in the court of no record to say heard is a stretch, to say stretch is a lie. My pleated plant pants were drenched in sweat as my abuser's lawyer in her wrinkled skirt and ruffled sweater heckled me into a corner. To say corner is generous because in the court of no record where the abuser is petitioner and the victim respondent, the walls are made of ideas so the men can walk straight through them. Okay, um, I'll read one more poem. And I just want to thank everyone again um, for tonight. This has been so amazing. Um, and all the readers, thank you for your words and your testimony and your courage. Um, so my mom and I were joking about this poem earlier <laughs> because she read it um, in the new issue. And she thought that what I meant by this poem was that her love for me was only in the imagination. <laughs> So, hey, mom, I want to clarify um, that when I was writing this poem, I was thinking about the way love, like when it transcends the body and happens also in the imagination, um, which I think of as like the location of ultimate empathy. Um, that's the most supreme kind of love. So love you, mom. Run away. I make imaginary places where real things happen. Caves filled with mangoes a shop with misshapen dresses covered in stains. People I loved dead because I dreamed it. Last night it was my father and my mother could not cry because her crying made it real. Friday night, the paws of a neighborhood dog are left severed on my porch. I feel what is missing of the dog until I am only hands and feet. Fear catches like a, like a bark in the throat. A man I know wrote a book about a girl who took her own life. He morphed himself into her as if that could ever be possible, which of course is an act of violence. What do I know writing my way out of fear? As a kid, I used to pack a suitcase full of candy and run away, pedaling down the street while my mom shouted from the stoop pumping my hairy little legs just to prove I could disappear. I once hid in the neighbor's garage for hours beside an old firebird that lived under a tarp. It was the 80s, satanic panic, stranger danger. I watched my mother grow afraid, feeling the thrill of her panic inside me. It was real. Having scared myself into grief, I went home. She loved me like a mother, which of course is an act of the imagination. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That was gorgeous. Um, so uh, Jennifer Zeng has shown up and I'm going to ask Jennifer to read and then we're going to unmute and everyone's going to give a huge applause of thanks to all of our readers. Jennifer. Hi, everyone. I thought I had more time. We knew I couldn't come till the second half, but I thought it was five to seven my time. Anyway, I really wish I could have come to hear everyone. I was so excited and honored to be on the poster, the digital poster. So anyway, thank you all for being here and thank you, the Adrop Journal people for hosting this what I can already tell was a fabulous event. Um, this is my first Zoom reading. It's so strange because I usually love reading and it's a little strange to feel more nervous in the comfort of my own home than on a stage in an auditorium full of people. It's very odd, um, but I needed to do that. So thank you for that too. Um, like many writers, I often go to the page to, to think or to feel just to try to understand something that vexes me. And I wrote this piece while I was living on Wampanoag land on the island of Martha's Vineyard. And tonight I'll be reading it to you while sitting on Ohlone land in Santa Cruz, California, which is to say that the thing that vexes me still persists. Menemsha Hills Reservation. 
I'm only going to take one, she said, already a guilty edge to her voice, as if some part of her felt it was wrong to take even one, and she was rationalizing, anticipating my condemnation of her. But less than a minute later, she found another one she liked and quickly picked it up and said, one more's okay. A rhetorical question posed to no one in particular. She nodded slightly in the direction of her daughter and said, just one for me and one for her, that's it. And suddenly it seemed as if she'd adopted C for the sole purpose of moments like this to be allowed to take one more of something when she was already pushing her limit, as if her daughter existed to double her quota, to increase twofold her right to possess things. Then again, to raise a child requires selflessness, perhaps even a relinquishment by half of oneself and to raise a child alone as she had requires more sacrifice still. I couldn't help but think that if every person who visited the beach took two rocks, by year's end, there wouldn't be any rocks left. So when she said one for her and one for C, I felt prematurely relieved, not knowing that within seconds, she would pick up a third rock. This one rose colored and gray with a band of white around its circumference. This one as big as the first and second combined like a gambler who slides one stack of chips into another with a bang, she knocked two of the rocks together and said, which one? As if she were planning to adhere to her second self-imposed limit and choose between them. The rocks made a sound like two pool balls colliding. I half expected to hear an eight ball rolling into a leather drop pocket, but there was nothing except her voice saying in reference to her latest acquisition, it feels so good in my hand, like it was meant to be held. She held the rose gray rock in her left hand and the first two awkwardly in her right before abruptly thrusting all three into her jacket pockets. Should we go back, she asked, glancing in the direction of our daughters. Sure, I said, and we walked back ungracefully over the rocks. I was slightly alarmed by the rapid escalation of her desire and its fulfillment, her instant disregard for the limits she herself had set. Then she said, what I really want is a bigger rock, which confounded me because in fact, I'd just been marveling at how very big the rocks were that she'd put in her pockets, at how very large her appetite for them had been. I felt a wave of guilt for being a resident of the area who had invited her there only to passively witness her taking rocks from the beach as if they were owed to her as if the earth were at last making amends for crimes it had committed against her. She seemed not to think of it as taking, but as replenishing. I did nothing to discourage her from taking the first or second or third rock. I simply watched surprised as she took them. In truth, I was tired of correcting white people's behavior tired of functioning as a moral compass on their journeys through the wilderness of life. She wanted a beach with sand, so we drove to one that had a long jetty made of beautifully colored boulders. We walked out to the end and I said jokingly, well, here are some bigger rocks. But even as I laughed, I beheld a horrifying image of her hiring a crane to lift one of the most beautiful boulders out of the beach and into her truck and her driving away with it, taking it back to the city with her. I felt an acute sense of relief when this didn't happen. As we were leaving, I saw a slim blue gray rock bearing a delicate line of white, like a jet stream across its front. And because she was especially fond of striped rocks, I bent down to show it to her naively assuming she had finished plundering the town and she exclaimed, oh, it's a very preppy one. 
and without deliberating or making any effort to appear to be struggling to decide, she put the rock in her pocket with the others. I was startled and speechless and prayed in my tortured Catholic way that the ghosts of the land would perceive my speechlessness, not as passivity or weakness, but as a silence I had observed in their honor. And I wondered between the two of us, who was worse? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask everybody to unmute and let's give our readers a huge deserved applause. Oh, stop it. Thank <laughs> yeah, we're not stopping it. We're gonna keep going, Jenny. <laughs> My dog is like, thought I was calling her. Sorry, everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for Thank reading Adroit. Keep reading, keep writing, uh, keep safe, and let's vote the fucker out. Sorry. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Have a good Thanks, night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much, everybody.